Hello everyone, welcome to A plus BI. This channel is all about complex numbers and in this video we're going to be solving a trigonometric equation with complex numbers and imaginary numbers. We have cosine z plus i sine z equals e, e is Euler's number which is about 2.7. e comes up in a lot of different occasions such as limits, exponential growth, compound interest, so on and so forth. Now if you're new to complex numbers go ahead and check out my lecture videos and if you like algebra trigonometry number theory then go ahead and check out my other channel cyber math cyber with an s anyways so let's go ahead and see how we can solve this equation at least we'll make different approaches different attempts so the first approach since we have complex numbers on both sides we're gonna Use the fact that if two complex numbers are equal like a plus b i and c plus d i, then we can safely say that the real parts are equal and the imaginary parts are equal, right? So that's a well-known fact, hopefully. So looking at that, looking at the equation this way, can we safely say that the real part is cosine z here, so this should equal e, which is the real part on the right-hand side, because the number on the right-hand side is real some, some people say I, I talk too fast recently is that the case please let me know uh, I try to keep my videos short as you know no longer than 10 minutes you probably know that but at the same time I don't want to just rush over things so the real part is e and then the imaginary part since there e is real the imaginary part should be zero okay so from here we get a system of equations cosine z equals e and sine z equals zero. But you probably know that, hopefully, if sine z is zero, then cosine z is either one or negative one because we have the famous or infamous equation sine squared z plus cosine squared z equals one, even though z is complex. Wait a minute, did you say z is complex? What does that mean? <laughs> well, here's the trick. We don't have a solution for this system, so we can't solve the problem this way because z is not real. Can you believe that? <laughs> okay, kind of hard to believe, right? So this equation only holds if a, b, c, d are real numbers. And of course, that's the very definition of a complex number. a and b are supposed to be real as well as c and d. So this approach is definitely not going to work. But at least I tried, right? Okay, let's look at it from another perspective. Maybe we we're going to call it the second approach. And it looks like I'm going to be using three approaches. I wasn't planning to, but it just turned out to be. So the second approach is going to be, why don't I just use some trigonometric facts, such as I can go ahead and use substitution because substitution is awesome. Why don't we replace cosine z with c and sine z with s? We know that c squared plus s squared is equal to 1 from the Pythagorean theorem right hopefully so if cosine z is c then sine z which is s squared can be written as or s from here can be hopefully written as the squared but here you need to be careful it is plus or minus okay i'm just going to use the plus sign and see what happens at the end but you can definitely look at the other case so now we can write this equation in terms of c make sense I'm going to replace cosine z with c and sine z with s, which is square root of 1 minus c squared. And just treat it as a radical equation because that's what it is. So how do you solve radical equations? You isolate the radical, right? And then square both sides. That's the general method. So let's do that. Isolate the radical, which is this one, this part right here and then square both sides. I squared is negative one. Hopefully you know that. Don't forget one thing that you should never ever forget is I squared equals negative one because I is defined as the square root of negative one. By the way, negative one has two square roots, but I is the principal square root, okay? So I squared is negative one and then this will become one minus C squared. And notice that even if I go with the negative solution for sine Z, when we square both sides, it's still going to give me a positive solution, which kind of explains why we get extraneous solutions from 
squaring both sides in radical equations. Sometimes, not all the time. Here, on the right-hand side, we get e squared plus c squared minus 2ec by using the formula. And then if you multiply by negative 1, this is going to become c squared minus 1 equals e squared plus c squared minus 2ec. And now c squared is going to cancel out, and we're going to end up with something like this. What are you trying to solve for? e is a constant, so I want to solve for c, which is cosine z. Makes sense, right? Let's put that on the left-hand side, 2ec, and add 1 to both sides. So now we have the following. And since I'm trying to solve for c, let's divide both sides by 2e, which is, again, a constant. And now we end up with c, which is cosine of z. That's why substitution is very powerful and helpful, because notice that we saved a lot of time by replacing cosine z with c. Okay? What does that give us? What is that supposed to mean? In other words, how do you find z from here? Okay, a cheap solution would be z is arc cosine of this expression right here. It's not always the case, but, you know, this could be one of the solutions. But this is not super helpful, is it? What is the arc cosine of this constant? You can definitely evaluate this. By the way, is this going to be greater than 1? That's something to think about. Since C is complex, right? That's what we said at the beginning. Remember, we tried to treat it as a real number, but it didn't work. So Z is probably complex. So this may not be less than or equal to 1. Okay? So that's kind of problematic. This approach, not very helpful. You can do it if you know some identities, but we're always gonna, all, we're already gonna use it with the third method. So why not repeat it? I mean, why repeat it? So here's the third method, and this brings us to a very important point because this is Euler's identity. There's a reason why this problem was made up by myself, because I guess we could call it homemade in this sense. I don't think anybody else came up with an equation like this, even though it's very simple to come up with. But if you've seen this problem before. On YouTube let us know and feel free to share uh, a link in the comment section down below okay sometimes other youtubers share their comments and anyways that's a different story but we have this equation now and what we're gonna do is we're going to turn the left hand side to an exponential because Euler said that's why he is the best that this is the same as e to the power i z and it's very easy to prove so this brings us to a very, very nice equation, doesn't it? Look at that. We have E on both sides, same base. So this is like E to the power 1. So do we just solve this by writing IZ equals 1? But here's the thing. We're always allowed to multiply by E to the power 2 pi and I, which is 1 in the complex world. Because if you think about it, it is 1. Okay, I'm not going to get into the detail, details. Because some people that are rigorous are going to be like, oh, you're talking too much about the fundamentals. Yes, you know why? Sometimes I talk about the basics because not everybody is an expert like you guys, okay? That's why be patient, all right? Anyways, this is my event for today. So now, from here we get the following. e to the i z equals e to the power 1 plus 2 pi. And I, since I included the 2 pi and i thing, now I can go ahead and write this as i z equals 1 plus 2 pi and i, and a lot of times people are going to divide by i, but I don't do it. I usually multiply by negative i, so it's like my way or highway. Let's multiply by negative i. Negative i squared is 1, that's why I just forget about it, and this gives me z directly. And when I distribute the i, this gives me another negative i squared, which is 1, so we start with 2 pi n minus i. Very interesting solution, don't you think? So does that really work though? Well, here's the thing. It's kind of hard to check unless you use the formula. So e to the power i z is going to be e to the power i times 2 pi n minus i. That's going to be e to the power 2 pi n i minus i squared, which is 1. It's going to be e to the power 2 pi n i plus 1, which is going to be e to the power 2 pi n i times e to the power 1, which is e. And this is 1. So the answer will be e. And yes. This will satisfy our equation. So that should be the solution. Now, what is n? We forgot to talk about it. n is an integer. Do you think Wolfram Alpha can solve this problem? I think I asked this question to Wolfram Alpha. Did I? Hopefully. I did not forget. Looks like I did. Sorry about that. Never mind. I did. Okay. So as you can see here, Wolfram Alpha gives a really, really 
weird answer. I don't even know why. But anyways, that should be the same thing that I found, right? And this brings us to the end of this video. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Please let me know. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. I'll see you next time in another video. Until then, be safe, take care. Don't forget to watch CyberMath. And bye-bye.